Hello and welcome to our panel on future market intelligence of copper, where demand is going for the red metal and what its future uses could look like. I'm Ernest Scheider, a journalist with Reuters, and I write about the copper industry, uh, as well as many of the metals that go into electrification and electric cars. And that's a theme we'll be talking a lot about today. Uh, we've got four panelists uh, who have a wide variety of topics uh, to discuss with you today, uh, but I'm really interested in learning about where copper demand has gone during COVID and where it's going during the recovery. Uh, we've got Christina Kalman Schuler from DMM Advisory Group here with us today. who will be talking specifically about that. We're also joined by Peter Gorl from Metra Martech Limited, Luke Gear from ID TechX, and Dr. Luis Tessero from Fraunhofer. Now, all four of them have really meaty, great presentations for you to view. And then afterwards, we'll have a time of Q&A where you can feel free to ask your questions live uh, of our expert panelists. Let's dive in. Good afternoon. My name is Kristina Kaiman Schuler, and thank you, Ernest, for the introduction. And I will be uh, presenting about the copper substitution survey um, commissioned by the International Copper Association. We are DMM, DMM advisory group. We are an international management consultancy focusing on the mining metals and the diamond sector. Um, the usual disclaimer, um, I don't need to read out, and the antitrust guidelines of the International Copper Association, which provide the framework for our work. Um, there are two main themes which defines uh, substitution in 2020. One of, uh, one of them is, of course, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and an impact of this pandemic on the demand. Um, I just read out some highlights, um, how we analyzed uh, the different end use sectors because the different end use sectors were impacted to a different degree. For example, the utilities uh, sector, where energy uh, generation and uh, distribution, um, it's a long-term, objectives uh, um, and often they, um, these industries have also a government mandate and these were not really impacted by COVID-19. Some sectors, some utilities even uh, restocked at the low copper price. Um, on uh, the, the demand for home, household and consumer appliances was extremely strong during the pandemic. A very good example of, of that uh, um, uh, people installed additional air conditioners in their houses because they work from home. And of course, this had a very good uh, uh, impact on the demand for equipment wires, winding wires for motors, industrial tubes, and electronic plate sheets, street, uh, strips, and foils. Um, on the negative side, we, we experienced um, uh, a negative impact on uh, commercial construction, not necessarily residential, but definitely a commercial construction. So seriously impacted by COVID-19, leading to budget pressures, and uh, we um, uh, saw a in negative impact on uh, the demand for copper architectural plate sheets, strips and foils, bare wires and plumbing tubes. Similarly, the automotive sales have plummeted during 2020, and uh, this had an impact on uh, the automotive demand for automotive wires and, and, and some casting products. Of course, the second key theme of 2020 was um, the relatively low material, uh, copper material cost in the first half of 2020. And uh, just explaining you the chart on the, on the screen, the green line is the um, copper aluminum price ratio. The blue line is the copper steel rebar price ratio. And the red line is the annual net substitution. And uh, this analysis uh, uh, shows that there is a historically a very strong positive correlation between the copper aluminum price ratio and the net substitution. Um, and as you can see, the green line is, is increasing uh, since 2017. Um, but we, we experienced a slight lagging of net substitution um, in 2020. So we expect the net substitution slightly catching up with the uh, um, uh, copper aluminum um, price ratio. Historically, a net substitution uh, stands at 0.95% uh, 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 of the copper use. This is historically a relatively low level, 
as you can see on the chart, I explained to you the uh, red columns is the substitution, the loss uh, um, of copper use due to substitution. The blue part of the bars is the gain, where copper gains some um, uh, market share against alternative materials. And the purple par uh, part of the columns is miniaturization, where devices becoming smaller and therefore use less material, but they don't use different material, they still use copper. Um, the green line is the net substitution um, uh, um, on the copper use, so it's a kind of relative measurement. And the uh, um, yellow line is if you add up to the substitution and miniaturization, and this on the copper use. And you can see that uh, um, the main line is, of course, the, the green line, which is slightly increasing since 2017, but still stands historically on the low level. Um, now, since last year, there was a slight increase on the debt substitution. And the main reason was uh, for this was uh, that the um, large copper users were becoming more experienced with using uh, alternative materials and also the substitution gains. So initiatives which bring substitution gain like energy efficiency regulations, undergrounding or environmental uh, uh, regulation were relatively slow in 2020. Also miniaturization, um, there was a lower incentive to, to, to bring new miniaturization uh, uh, solutions and the existing miniaturization uh, technologies reached a technical and cost reduction limits. But I think it's very important to still maintain that uh, many copper applications um, have limited exposure to substitution as copper and copper alloys still provide the best cost performance combinations. Um, and especially where um, high conductivity, um, electrical and heat conductivity and corrosion and friction resistance is required. Now, um, what are the drivers in the change of net uh, material substitution and miniaturization? Um, on the um, left-hand side, you can see the slightly increased net substitution. And the main drivers here were the power cables, um, the copper alloys, uh, plate sheets, strips and foils, and especially the architectural applications. And to a certain extent, low voltage energy cables, which include automotive wiring and also uh, to a certain degree building wires. The miniaturization, the decline in miniaturization was uh, almost exclusively driven by the copper tubes and the industrial uh, um, tubes in the, um, the, the um, heat, uh, the, the HVAC uh, sector, the um, smaller diameter tubes, uh, um, the, 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 the reduction of the, of, the, of the diameter of the industrial tubes in the heat exchanger reached its technical limits. Now, of course, there are new themes which, which could be positive for copper. One of them is the high voltage DC networks. Uh, these are energy uh, uh, distribution networks, which are um, bringing um, uh, renewable energy from the site of the generation, which is very often offshore, to the site of consumption, which are more the urban areas. And this new um, uh, systems, they use new technology and um, reduce the electrical losses. And in many countries, they are regarded as a partial replacement of the existing um, uh, um, energy distribution network, um, connecting thermal and nuclear energy, energy generations with the site of uh, consumption, and therefore seen also as a tool to reduce a uh, carbon footprint. Um, this uh, HVDC networks, especially if they are underground, they have a higher uh, chance to use copper conductors than the overhead lines. Um, the next uh, slide is about the telecommunication uh, um, cables. And uh, although it's a very small market for copper, I think it's important to see how complicated substitution is and how many different factors impact it. Now, in 2020, now, now, uh, the, the telecommunication network basically consists about uh, of three main parts. One from the data creation to the distribution point, 
then for the distribution point to the home access, and then internally within the homes, uh, the internal telecommunication network. In 2020, the main substitution um, was happening in the first part, where, um, where optical fiber is off, um, uh, offering um, a better uh, um, performance cost ratio based on the fiber's bandwidth and scalability. But in the second part of this network, where from the distribution point to the home access, there is uh, less substitution happening. Uh, and these are that last 100 to 300 meter from the pole to the home. You might know this section that bringing fiber to the home. This is also how it's called, but it's very costly because the uh, urban areas conduits are full and they require also the owner's collaboration. So here still copper wires uh, um, uh, uh, have a strong market share. Internally in, in the homes, we, we saw that wireless does not substitute uh, um, the copper wires, they offer an alternative. While copper wires and the existing telecommunication connections are um, there for, uh, for reliable connection and for speed, and Wi-Fi is there more for convenience and for, for mobile applications. Now with the 5G uh, connections, uh, it slightly changes because the physical connections uh, will remain between the data creation and the 5G cell drop point. But we expect an increased substitution in the middle part of the, of the telecommunication network, um, especially because uh, um, uh, here um, uh, 5G can offer a, a lower cost solution to, to bring uh, uh, the connection to the home access. Um, but if you go into the house, inside the homes, uh, um, 5G again will be uh, obstructed by the walls um, and we, we still uh, uh, expect the copper wires uh, uh, um, uh, maintaining the market share for the internal telecommunication networks. Now, these 5G networks, of course, require specific equipment and uh, an antenna. And the, the, the main point is with 5G, again, is, is as well that it requires, uh, it works best for mobile applications outside of buildings and an environment with low humidity and low air pollution. So it will, won't be uh, working very well for all geographic regions. Um, we talk not so much about copper alloys, although copper alloys are one of the uh, um, largest markets of, of, of copper. And I think it's important to, to emphasize how important they are from, for, 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 for a number of applications. And here we picked on the friction application, high friction applications, and what kind of options um, are available. Of course, there are more options available, but these are the key uh, um, just to show you uh, what's happening in, in, in the industry. Of course, there are the traditional brass brass friction application. These are generally used for very high friction application like aerospace, oil, fracking, um, and uh, which require high mechanical strength of the material. Um, here, um, we don't see any substitution and the focus is more on improving the composition of copper alloys. Also for casting, um, brass is uh, um, the, the, the premium material for low tolerance precision casting, where other materials can't uh, um, deliver the, the, the performance. Now there is also in the middle of the slide, you can see um, applications which, which are not extremely critical, but still friction applications like machines. Here, um, very often we see brass and steel components are together, but still wears out very quickly. And therefore um, one component is always kept as brass, while the second is, 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 can be substituted to steel. Um, and of course, there are also another applications where, where the friction is, is not extremely high and also there might be weight, uh, could be an issue, high, uh, the weight of brass. And here the engineered plastics are coming in and uh, um, it is in interesting that how far plastics can, can offer uh, um, uh, uh, um, interesting performance also in these applications, but still brass is the, the, the gold standard for friction applications. Um, just a quick overview about uh, the different regions. 
and China is still the most loyal to COPAM. As you can see, it's uh, with 0.6% of the copper use um, as a uh, substituted in 2020. Um, although China is moving to a new economic model, um, and we expect in the in the next five to ten years um, uh, an increased cost fuel focus and also more openness to use alternative materials in China. Still, at the moment, proportionally, still uh, the most loyal region, uh, um, copper most loyal region. Um, if you look into the future, um, of course, the key topic is the high uh, copper material cost uh, uh, at the moment in the market. And we expect uh, on the back of this, this higher copper material cost, um, uh, increasing substitution in 2021, in 2022. And this will be mainly the areas of cable application, winding via industrial tube and some alloy application. Um, we expect this substitution reach certain limits in 2000, 2022. This is our, our view and uh, level out afterwards, unless we have uh, another new impetus from uh, increasing material costs. Also for substitution gain, we, we, we expect to see more environmental and energy efficiency regulations led by EU, China, and increasingly by the US, resulting, re resulting in, in gains for copper and electric motors, industrial tubes, and some transformers. Also, the, the higher copper material cost uh, will um, give incentive to new R&D into miniaturization, so into uh, reducing the material, the copper material used as opposed to substituting it. Um, but these R&D uh, um, uh, uh, initiatives and the project will, will have a certain delay while uh, um, will impact our demand. So it's kind of one to two year delay, we expect them. And the main market for miniaturization will be industrial tubes, um, electric uh, plates, um, uh, sheet strips and foils, electric motors and automotive buyers. Of course, this forecast has uh, the usual caveats of uh, um, any forward-looking statements. Now the summary, um, without repeating what I have told you already before, um, main themes were the, uh, the COVID-19 has impacted copper demand, um, and the main uh, um, theme is here that end users as OEM, uh, and OEMs focus more on solving issues related to COVID-19 uh, COVID as opposed to um, starting new substitution and miniaturization initiatives. Also, the copper material costs were relatively low in May 2020, and therefore the incentive to substitute was relatively low. Of course, the, the material costs increase and uh, this will set foundation for, for some substitution in 2021. Also carbon footprint reduction, renewable energy, energy efficiency, uh, efficiency, fuel efficiency are key themes, but these have long-term influence of OEMs and, uh, um, and that the impact was rather limited in, uh, in uh, 2020. Um, and again, just uh, summarizing in 2020, it was characterized by stable substitution um, at a relatively low uh, percentage of 0.95% of copper use. Um, um, and uh, generally substitution occurs where alternative materials bring additional benefits, not just price benefit, but also um, uh, benefits like lighter weight, corrosion, friction resistance or aesthetic or reduction of tax. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christina. Now, the first two slides I'll show you are the legal ones, which we're bound to show before making these presentations. In October 2019, Metro Martech reported on a project carried out in 2018 and the first half of 2019. We were looking at the trends expected to affect the amount of copper used globally up to 2030. Four months later, COVID-19 hit the world and we've been asked to comment on the national stimulus programs and how COVID is affecting the results of our earlier report. The new report has not been completed yet, but today I'll give you a preview, a glimpse of the method 
and show you some ideas on the four sectors we covered, which are building and construction, we focus on building, the energy sector, our focus generation and storage, manufacturing minus automotive, and automotive, particularly cars and light commercials. A, a word about the method. As a baseline, we use country forecasts of gross domestic product, GDP, up to 2030. After the first shocks of 2020 and the initial aftershocks of 2021, we arrived at a forecast 5% increase in 2021, followed by tapering growth and then relatively growth, relative growth, uh, world growth stability at 2.4 to 2.5 percent a year. This is slightly lower than the past 10 years. We've used many other respected information sources. Note in this project we've used 2010 value US dollars and metric tons, and as I say otherwise. Now the first slide, our work has mainly focused on the global scene. However, remember that there are great differences between the nations in terms of economic performance. The tart chart shows, for example, the growth of China and the flatlining of Japan. The second slide shows just one view, not the final answer of the downturn, followed by a return to growth of a similar pattern to the previous slide. The trend line from 2010 to 2020 is real, the three lines show top the world, middle the world without China, and bottom China. Note that it's not necessarily the case that a general bounce back occurs, which gets back up to the original trend line. A person who buys a car each year, if they miss a year, do not typically buy two cars the next year. On the other hand, if there's a move to go green with specific targets, great efforts may be made to get back to the original target timescale. Some sectors will bounce, some will not. Now remember we're talking about GDP here, adding copper values is another dimension. Let's look at stimulus packages. Here's an overview of the size and effect of selected countries' packages. The top of the slide shows some of the stimulus options, and I'll stray a little from the slide to give some more analysis. By May 2020, 12 trillion US current dollars had been allocated globally to COVID damage limitation and recovery. Countries adopted very different approaches, but the aim was to keep the economy going, to keep businesses afloat and to minimize unemployment. For comparison, we've used the amount allocated to national stimulus as a percentage of the country's GDP. Here are six countries in ascending order of the stimulus which they provided by October 2020. China, I'll say more, 5.2%. India, 9.7%. UK, 17.5%. US, 23.3%. And France, 24.6%. Japan, 42.6%. And Italy, 47.5%. Now you could expect that there would be more correlation between the amount of stimulus applied and the proportion of GDP and the dip and the recovery which resulted. The opposite appears more prevalent. China has relatively the least overt stimulus and the best GDP growth. Their forward planning probably includes what other countries are only now taking action on. Italy and Japan at the other end of the scale provided most stimulus. Both experienced poor recovery in 2020. Remember, Italy was hit badly at the start Japan, already struggling with low economic growth before the crisis, only in April and June passed large stimulus packages. 2021 figures so far show a more positive picture for Japan. Let's look at the sectors. So the first one is building and construction. The slide shows on the left points from the earlier report and on the right hand side, the February, March, 2021 view. I'm just going to pick two of these points for now. The 2019 view, faster growth was expected up to 2030, except for China, where the building sector had dropped in 2019. The 2021 February-March view, in the first half of 2020, showed a global 
drop of 6% in output and then began to pick up. Early this year, plus 1.2% was forecast for 2021. In mid-March, an OECD note is more optimistic, saying perhaps over 5% and then back to 4% next year. Building in China is now a recovery sector. 2021 is expected to be a promising year with the release of the 14th five-year plan in March and the 100th anniversary of the uh, CCP in July. The construction market in India was expected to grow almost twice as fast as China if, up to 2030. However, COVID hit the country hard. The latest March figures suggest that India is recovering. You can tell we are looking at quite a fast moving world situation. Notice in particular the trend to bring building work off site and to using modular units producing quantity. This may be more efficient and use less copper, but it could also win back markets for the durability of copper. Notice also the extra impetus being given to climate change and the opportunities in alternatives to a traditional gas or oil-based heating. Let's look at copper use. In 2018, 6 million tonnes of copper were used in building. The 2019 report estimated that it would have reached a total of 8.5 to 10 million tonnes for 2030. There will still be significantly more demand for copper than there was before the crisis, but the 2021 estimates in mid-March could show a loss of a million tonnes in 2030 compared with the earlier forecast. At the best, there could be a loss of 300,000 tonnes. The latest forecast suggests this may be a little pessimistic. The world is moving on already. Let's look at energy. The top right hand comment refers to the next few years for energy as a whole. The second right hand comment reflects factory and office closures, lockdowns, etc. The third comment that the growth of copper is likely to be faster than before the crisis is caused by the increasing switch to renewables, wind and solar, and to even out the less predict predictable energy sources, energy storage and or high voltage direct current transmission lines. These can be copper rich applications. In addition, more coal plants are closing, new coal plants are being cancelled. These last points are less the effect of COVID than the changing balance of energy costs and the increasing pressure to meet climate change targets. In 2018, a total of 0 .5, 0 0.85 million tonnes of copper were installed for generation and storage. The new forecast figures up to 2030 are for at least 2 million tonnes. Let's look at manufacturing. Historically, uh, manufacturing has kept up with GDP growth. Initial reporting up to the middle of 2020 showed a dramatic fall in manufacturing output globally. This was caused by workforce absences due to sickness and precautionary measures such as closing factories, distribution centres and retail outlets. All but the last, retail, are falling back into place. Industries reacted differently to the Covid crisis in quarter one 2020 and are recovering at different speeds too. We'll have more of this in the report. Manufacturers with complex distribution chains or who had less flexible access to alternative suppliers could still be particularly vulnerable to component or material shortages. Despite all this, manufacturing, excluding automotive, was reported to be back to 2019 levels in many parts of the world by quarter 24, quarter four, 2020, and 5 million tonnes of copper. The 2030 figure, not available yet. Let's look at automotive. The second point down is climate change. More definite action is now being taken than in 2018-19, and this trend is continuing to accelerate. Low emission cars are an important part of this. Electric vehicles on average use three times as much copper as conventionally driven vehicles. Global car sales grew consistently until 2018. Now growth is not guaranteed. 2018-2019 saw a slowdown, which then slid into the COVID crisis. The change over to electric drive is certainly a factor, 
which could cause a slowdown. There are still considerable differences in forecasts of how fast growth will be in electric vehicle production and the market share over the next five years, five years, nine years. The government intervention is needed until electric vehicles costs are near to or better than the internal combustion engine which they replace. Some forecasts predict that the cost parity will be achieved by 2030. Note that China is now replacing consumer incentives to buy electric vehicles by a mandate backed by large fines on auto manufacturers to sell 40% of their vehicles electric in 2030. The large number of electric cars sold annually in China are still only 5% or so of their annual sales. There are also some potential barriers other than price and range. In 2018 project, we forecast 40 to 45% of cars sold to be electric. This year, some industry commentators are forecasting 50% or more. Others are skeptical that charging facilities will be too few and too quickly superseded by faster, safer methods. Other factors, continue acceptance of the inherent safety of the battery systems and possible cyber interference with safety measures. General availability of the scarcer materials needed. Our forecasts are based on rather fewer cars being produced, but more of them being fully electric. In terms of copper, at least one extra million tonnes of copper may be used for electric vehicles in 2030, compared with 2018. This, interestingly, is the same as our pre-COVID forecast, but with a recognition of a likely smaller number of cars and a higher percentage that will be electric. Now some general points. The COVID crisis and slightly unpredictable state of the Chinese market have slowed growth, but do not on average appear to provide more than a stagger on the way to the 2030 outlook. It's likely to cause a slippage of at least six months to a year on the previous 2018 expectations uh, in the demand for 20, in 2030 for our chosen sectors. On the slide, we have three uncertainty factors two concerning the virus, the third political uncertainty. Here's another potentially important factor. Governments have borrowed so much to reduce the effect of the virus. Many may be reluctant to rush into major new spending plans, even for climate change. And this could be magnified if inflation starts growing faster than expected. In any case, it appears that there still will be a significant increase in the use of copper in 2030 over 2018 in our sectors. Thank you. Now I'll pass you over to Luke. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, yes, yeah, so my name's Luke. I'm a C senior technology analyst at ID TechX. Um, for those of you who don't know ID TechX, we're a market research firm for emerging technologies. Um, we cover all the emerging technologies that you can see as icons on this slide. I lead the electric vehicles research. And today I'm going to be talking about power electronics devices within electric vehicles and the associated copper demand. So um, first I'd just like to start off by setting the scene. So over 10 million electric cars were on roads globally um, by the end of 2020 and, that, and 3 million sales were in 2020 alone which represents about 40% year-on-year growth. Um, and so despite the enormous challenges COVID had on the overall auto market, which actually declined, electric vehicles was, were resilient to those changes um, and have built up a lot of momentum. And we think they're going to grow from about 4% market penetration last year to um, continue to over 80% market penetration by 2040. And as a result, you know, because the powertrain of the electric vehicle is completely different to that of the internal combustion engine, this presents many new materials opportunities, um, not just within the power electronics, but also um, the motors, the batteries and the power electronics. Electronics introduce many new materials in thermal management, in cathodes and anodes um, and so on and so forth. 
um, that we wouldn't have seen in the internal combustion engine. And of course, for um, metals, which are used to some extent in um, ice as well. So copper, for example, um, is used in the internal combustion engine um, powertrain, but it has much more of a presence in the EV powertrain in things like the motors, um, uh, the batteries and the power electronics. So when we talk about power electronics, what exactly do we mean? Um, so broadly, power electronics is control and conversion of power, um, stepping up and down voltages or converting back and forth between AC and DC powers. Um, within, specifically within the context of an electric vehicle, there are three main components that is in every electric vehicle. And so that's the onboard charger, converting the AC grid supply into high voltage DC for the battery. There's the main inverter, which is between the battery and the motor. Um, this operates at the highest power compared to the other uh, electronics on the electric vehicle and converts DC to three phase AC for the smooth operation of the electric motor. And then you have smaller, uh, lower voltage and power converters, which go between things like high voltage and low voltage battery. Um, and the low voltage ba battery goes on to power the hotel facilities of the car, like the infotainment, the aircon, and so on. But these are the three um, core components of power electronics within the electric vehicle. And the enabling technology behind power electronics is transistors, so um, electronic switches. These are created with semiconductors, so uh, various configurations of P and N type doped semiconductors. And for the history of the electric vehicle market, um, silicon IGBTs has been the semiconductor technology of choice. Um, but we're now facing a transition to wideband gap semiconductors, um, silicon carbide and gallium nitride. And you can see the relative properties of these compared to silicon in the radar diagram on the right hand side of this slide. Um, so focusing on silicon carbide, you can see that it has much better uh, thermal properties compared to silicon. Um, ultimately, what this means is you can increase your power density and reduce the overall package of your inverter and power module uh, packages. The electron velocity is much higher, which means um, you can increase your uh, uh, frequency switching. Ultimately, that means you can downsize your passive components like the inductors and capacitors inside the package itself, which again, they take up quite a lot of real, real estate. So it's about shrinking the overall uh, volume of the inverter package. Um, and then finally, the, the wide band gap of the um, semiconductors naturally means they can tolerate higher voltages and have a, um, a higher uh, level at which uh, leakage current occurs. And that fits in with the trend we're seeing, um, particularly in the premium market for electric vehicles, where you have um, automakers releasing models which want to operate at 800 to 900 volts to enable things like faster charging and other consumer driven features. Now, within the realm of the, uh, the applications I'm talking about in this study, um, silicon carbide is the, the main transition that the inverters and converters I'm talking about. Um, are going to trend towards. So because of their um, ability to naturally uh, be able to operate at higher powers and voltages because of their thermal properties, um, that means they sit nicely in the operational ranges of things like EV inverters and um, commercial and grid scale renewable energy inverters and converters. And this isn't something that's happening in the future or five years from now it's already been happening in the electric vehicle market. So Tesla was one of the first companies to introduce a silicon carbide inverter in their Model 3. They've steadily been rolling this out to the rest of their lineup. Um, so the Model Y in 2020 and uh, the, re the refreshes of the Model um, S and X. But this is also a trend that's being driven by, um, as I mentioned before, the premium segment of cars. So um, those in the price bracket north of uh, 70,000 US dollars, um, where consumers are demanding um, north of 300 kilowatt charging, um, greater ranges, greater performance and efficiencies and so on. Um, these 
are naturally starting to uptake silicon carbide inverters. So Lucid Air um, by Lucid Motors, we believe is going to be introducing a silicon carbide inverter. Um, and some other power module manufacturers have also made announcements of how they'll be supplying uh, the premium car segments in the next few years. So this is a trend that's under a quarter of plug-in cars sold today, but we think it's going to be about 50% by 2031. So it's only going to increase from here on out. And getting inside the inverter and power module packages to actually look at where is the copper located inside these devices. So on the left hand side is a traditional inverter package. Um, it contains your uh, DC link capacitors, all the uh, controller and PCB boards, um, and also all the things like connection plates and bus bars and the, um, the thermal management system and the cooling channels. The main active component is located at the bottom of this. So it's the um, silicon IGBT power module. And an open view of that is shown on the right hand side. Um, so in the inverter package, most of the copper is found in the um, connections between things. Um, so this is the uh, any connection plates there are or any bus bars um, and other um, small connections and wires in the package itself. Um, and then in the power module package, this is where we see um, most of the copper. So a schematic of the power module package is shown on, on this slide here. Um, and you can see here that a lot of the copper is located on uh, the substrate itself. So the direct bond copper substrate is um, sandwiched between two pieces of copper on either side. Um, typically, they're about 100 to 500 microns thick, um, so half a mil. And um, as we'll see later, this is where uh, most of the copper by weight is in the inverter package itself. But we're also seeing copper start to be introduced in other areas of the power module package. So, for example, in very high power applications like wind, offshore or onshore wind, um, the base plate is often made of copper to improve the thermal performance. Um, and the wire bonds as well, as we shrink our package and increase the aerial power density, one of the common points of failure is the um, soldered aluminium wire bonds. And we're also seeing a transition here as we encroach on these higher powers towards copper um, wire bonds and frames. And this is exactly what Tesla have done actually in their silicon carbide inverter. So on the right hand side, um, I'm showing a diagram of a traditional uh, silicon IGPT chip with conventional wire bonds. Um, and then on the right hand side of that image is a, a copper frame that's replacing these wire bonds. Um, the main advantage of that is you're reducing the localized hotspots on the die surface area. Um, and so as you cycle the system, ultimately that means that um, the lifetime is improved um, by up to 10 times according to the, uh, the testing done by Mitsubishi Electric who were one of the first companies to introduce this technique. So um, copper is really becoming essential um, to facilitate this transition to wide band gap semiconductors and higher powers. But looking at the pie, pie chart on the left hand side, um, so although copper is essential in these areas, um, the copper uh, uh, use by weight inside the inverter package for wire bonds and uh, lead frames is actually quite low. Uh, less than a percent and you can see most of the copper is coming from the power module package packages on the dbc substrate and then um, the other main sources of copper are um, the connection panel between the different um, components inside the inverter package and then the phase lead terminals which um, go from the uh, connect the inverter into the, the motor with three um, phase leads Well, how does this compare um, when we look at the traditional silicon IGBT inverter with the silicon carbide? So on the left hand side is the um, is comparing the die area. So um, as I mentioned before, it's possible to reduce the uh, the die area of silicon carbide. 
and comparing a standard Infineon um, with the ST microelectronics um, dies, which are, are found in inside Tesla's inverter, we see a reduction of about 60%. Um, and then looking on the right-hand side at the, uh, the right-hand chart, we see how this translates to the overall inverter package. So here in blue, I'm comparing a, a Model 3 in reference to a 2019 Nissan Leaf. Um, and at the inverter level, there are um, other uh, innovations and, and structural differences that have also led to the weight and volume reduction. But the main driver behind it is, of course, the transition to the silicon carbide chip. And again, you can see here volume and weight is reduced by over 50 percent um, and power density is improved uh, threefold. So at ID Techics, we've studied this in two areas. So as I've just been through, one is electric vehicles. Um, the other is renewables, so wind and solar capacity additions. So this is shown on the left hand side here, um, our forecasts for wind and solar capacity additions. Um, we think about 440 gigawatts will come online yearly by 2030. But when we compare this to combined motor output from electric cars, you can see how the scale is an order of magnitude different. So um, on the right hand side, we have solar and wind energy, uh, as I mentioned, below 500 uh, gigawatts yearly. Um, and cars are at um, between 3.5 and 4 uh, terawatts um, yearly. So an order of magnitude different. And that's simply down to the sheer volume that we see from the auto market, which is currently um, about 90 million cars sold globally um, before COVID-19. Um, so it has enormous volumes, which ultimately means it's going to come out on top when we talk about copper demand. But moving on to some of those copper demand figures. So as I just mentioned, electric car inverters really are dominating in terms of copper demand. Um, that's because they, uh, the inverter in, on the car operates at the highest power, 300 kilowatts, um, compared to um, 20 uh, kilowatts for onboard chargers and under uh, two or three kilowatts for DC-DC converters. Um, and then compared to solar and wind, um, again, it's um, much, much higher simply because, as I say, of the volume of the um, global car market is, is very large. So we're reaching at about 20 kilotons of copper per year um, by 2030. And the accumulated amounts over the 15 years from 2015 to 2030, it's about 100 kilotons of copper across all these different segments. And because electric car inverters are so important, um, we're also showing here a long term view of electric car inverters and the impact of the transition to silicon carbide. So um, the dashed line you can see shows the uh, amount of copper that's required if we stick with just silicon IGBT power modules without those, any of those advantage I, advantages I spoke about with wide band gap semiconductors. Um, and you can see that's reduced by about 30% when you include or account for that transition to silicon carbide. So overall, um, we're looking at about 45 kilotons of copper per year by 2040. Um, and accumulated again over the 25 years, it's about 425 kilotons of copper. Um, but with that, that ends my presentation. Thank you everyone for listening. I'd now like to hand over to Luis. Thanks, Luke. For the last um, presentation of today, I'm going to talk about some work that we did uh, commissioned by ICA, um, providing independent views on the topic of uh, urban mining. And the first question we have here is, well, what is urban mining? And for that, we have to step back a bit uh, and look at the anthroposphere. The anthroposphere, as you may just guess, includes people and everything made and changed by people. And as such, the anthroposphere contains a very large quantity and wide variety of materials. And urban mining aims to manage and use these materials that are being used and discarded um, as a source of raw material supply. So the idea is to utilize the waste of today 
and to anticipate and capture the value contained in the waste of tomorrow. And of course, everything that is present in this urban mine um, comes from conventional mining at some point. So the, the chain looks like this. So you start with geological resources that are exploited through mining, and then they become part of the anthropogenic stocks. And at some point, these, uh, these raw materials become available um, to go back into uh, the cycle by capturing, uh, capturing and reprocessing them. And theoretically, um, the urban mine uh, encompasses uh, a variety of sources. So you can think of tailings, the things that we are using and the things that we've stopped using, um, but have deposited in landfills. In this case, um, I'm showing a, a picture with a conceptualization of the raw material cycle, the anthropogenic raw material cycle, which starts in mine with mining. This is an input to both the circular economy and the economy as a whole. Um, and directly from mining, um, we have the generation of tailings. And these tailings may or may not be recovered um, or reprocessed to uh, gather new materials, new raw materials from them. Um, urban mining then also encompasses the use of the post-consumer scrap coming out of that stocking use at the bottom. And in principle also, um, you could go and recover raw materials from landfills uh, that are being set up now or that have been set up for a long time. Now, urban mining is a part, not, doesn't, doesn't quite completely overlap with the circular economy. The circular economy is bigger. And there are some important cycles that um, are within the circular economy that do not belong to urban mining. So the recycling of manufacturing scrap um, is a very important part of recycling. It's an important part of the circular economy. It does not uh, belong to urban mining, though. And the same applies to reuse, repair, and remanufacturing which are key concepts of the circular economy, but do not belong to urban mining. Urban mining starts when these um, products are discarded and are not reused, not repairable, and, and are not going to be remanufactured, but are declared to be waste. And then as waste, they can go into this um, recycling step. So I said before, theoretically, you can get secondary raw materials through urban mining from tailings, from stocks in use, and from landfill. Now, practically or quantitatively, uh, the very the vast majority of secondary raw materials coming from urban mining are coming from end-of-life recycling. Um, there is essentially no outflow today from mine tailings for reprocessing, and there is essentially no outflow today from landfills for material recovery. Um, quantitatively speaking, urban mining today is almost tantamount to uh, end-of-life recycling. And end-of-life recycling is only a part, it's only a small fraction of the overall potential. So if you, if you look at uh, studies dealing with the potential of the urban mine, they will focus on the stock in use. So how much material is embedded in appliances and buildings and infrastructures that we have in use today. However, for material recovery, only the part of that stock in use that's leaving use is actually relevant. So to put it shortly, nobody's going to turn, you know, tear down a building to get at the steel and copper um, while the building is still usable. It is only when the building uh, becomes obsolete and needs to be replaced that those materials are free to be um, to be reused. And to try and put some numbers in here, um, you know, back in 2010, those are nice round numbers. Um, we had a for copper, we had a, um, a cumulative extraction from the lithosphere, so it's of 650 million tons. Of those 650 million tons. Back then, 100 million tons were estimated to be in tailings, 350 million in stocks in use, and 140 million in landfill. And uh, well, the numbers have grown until now, but this distribution um, remains today. So most 
copper that has been extracted is still in use today. And a part of that is becoming available uh, for end of life recycling and actively being the output of this urban mine. Now the urban mine is distributed across the globe. If we look at this picture on the very left, we have the aggregated global picture with um, different end use um, categories. So we have most copper is bound in buildings and infrastructures. We have a series of industrial uses. We also have transport and consumer products. And overall, um, this amounted to around 450 million tons in 2018. This is distributed across the different regions of the world. And if we just pick, for example, Europe, um, and the stock in use in Europe being around 80 million tons, if you pick for uh, a price of 7,000 US dollars, um, you come up with a value of around 580 billion US dollars in stock. But of course, this is everything that's in use um, right now. The stock outflow is much smaller. Um, it's around 19 billion US dollars uh, was in 2018. And that number is a theoretical potential because that material would still have to be captured and processed and uh, so on. And those, that capturing, that processing um, can be very intricate. So if you think of this urban mine and compare it to a geological mine, um, the urban mine is very diffuse. It is also very um, heterogeneous. You have different types of scrap, different types of waste that are being discarded, that are being thrown into bins. Um, these bins are being collected and then they need to be sorted and classified and brought to the right facilities. This is in contrast to conventional mining where the facilities are on site and they are um, optimized to deal with a particular input. In this case, the facilities have to be very flexible and they have to deal with a very wide range of inputs and also a wide range of targets because you're not trying to just recover copper from a particular stream, you're trying to recover also the entire value of the stream as much as possible. So this can get very diffused um, and it needs to be profitable for it to happen. So the material value of the discards, they have to pay, that has to pay for logistics, it has to pay for processing, and it has to pay for all other costs. And um, just for an example, just, just think about mobile phones. Mobile phones are, are a great example for urban mining, not, last, not least because they tend to be stored in, um, in drawers and they take a long time to come out. But even if all of them were to come out, the material value of a particular mobile phone is, uh, was recently estimated to be about $1.10. So that $1.10 has to pay for this large chain and recovering um, those materials. So the entire logistics, the entire technology, the entire labor, um, and so on. And of that uh, one ten, three quarters is gold. Another 10% are other um, precious metals, and only then comes copper. Um, but of course, without copper metallurgy, that gold and those precious metals cannot be recovered. But certainly the driver in that particular case um, is not the copper, and it shows some of these interconnection between metals um, in the urban mine, uh, much like there are in uh, regular mining. Now, the efficiency of recycling is um, captured by different recycling rates at different points along this, uh, this chain, this recycling chain. And we don't have time today to go into the intricacies of recycling rates. Just um, keep in mind that they have different definitions. So there is no such thing as the recycling rate. If you hear one, just make sure um, you understand what it's trying to measure at what point along this chain, because you can have this different numbers for something called the recycling rate for a number of metals. And um, just to make sure you're not comparing apples and oranges, you should always know what the exact definition is, what this recycling rate is um, trying to define. 
And end of life recycling and end of life recycling rates are only going to get more, to become more important. So from 1990 to 2018, the amount of new scrap of copper new scrap for manufacturing grew about 30%. In that same time period, um, the end of life scrap potential grew by 140%. And this trend, this difference in the speed that the scrap quantities are, are um, increasing, is expected to continue into the future. And to be distributed along the world in different, in different, um, um, with different, with the same tendency, um, but different speeds. So if you look at here at this figure on the top left, we have construction and demolition waste containing copper um, in North America, in the EU, in Japan, and in China. And as we can see, and we would expect North America and the EU um, with the relatively mature building, inf building uh, stocks um, dominate the generation of um, end of life scrap. But already in the, for electronics and for industrial scrap and also for vehicles, in the very near future, China is going to overtake both North America and the EU um, as the main generator of scrap at those first generations of um, appliances and industrial machinery reaches the end of their life and just starts uh, the amount of scrap um, from post-consumer or in this case post-use um, starts to increase uh, very rapidly. Now capturing that scrap and utilizing it um, is something that we can certainly agree is a good thing. But it's also in competition with other good things that we want to have. And they, they, they interact with each other and they're not always um, supporting. So if you think of miniaturization, for example, um, miniaturization leads to less material use during production. This is something we want to have more value from less raw materials. At the same time, miniaturization makes it more difficult to get those exact raw materials at the end of the product's life because it's small, it's more complex, and the value contained in that one particular product tends to then become smaller. Um, something similar happens with circularity. So if we repair, reuse, remanufacture a product, that product stays in use for longer. This is something we definitely want. Um, but it also means that this particular product will stay longer in the loop and it will take that much longer for it to become available um, for urban mining. And such relationships are, are there with um, a number of different issues where a conscientious trade-off has to be made, a conscious trade-off where you say this is, this is good, this is also good, and we decide as a society or as a company, we need to do um, that one. And urban mining is not always going to win there, um, but it's definitely also a good option to keep in mind. Now, in order to move forward um, with urban mining, it's not something that uh, one individual, one company, or even a particular sector can do. It will require uh, the effort, the concerted efforts uh, from a number of actors. So. The collection step and the initial sorting, this is usually organized by governments at all levels. So from the local government that's in charge of collecting the waste um, to national governments who are in charge of uh, making the rules uh, for said waste collection. Um, it is the public um, that disposes of a large part of that waste um, and whether they are bringing it to the right place or not makes a difference um, when it comes uh, to the quantities of materials that can be captured. Uh, you just have to look at the reports on um, missed throws for small electronic equipment, for example, in Europe, where the infrastructures are good, but still small electronic um, equipment is found in the regular trash bin. We also need from the industry um, engagement, not only from the recycling industry that needs to uh, keep up with the complexity of the of the materials, but also from the manufacturing side, um, recycling and urban mining would be um, easier um, if product information was available on those products and, and whether 
the products are designed to be dismantled and recycled in the first place. And at the very end, we also have academia and research um, that needs to work and continue to work on uh, providing technologies that uh, can deal with the complexity of end of life products. So with those thoughts, um, I'd just like to end this presentation and I'm looking forward to your questions uh, in the following session. Thank you very much. Hello and happy Monday. Welcome to our Q&A for our virtual Copper Conference panel session on future material intelligence. I'm Ernest Scheider with Reuters and I'm joined by an expert group of panelists that you just heard from uh, who've got a lot to talk about today. Uh, we've got a few sort of general introductory questions for me and then we're going to toss it over to you, the audience. Um, so we know time is tight, so we're going to jump right in. I want to start with Christina. Thanks for your great presentation. Um, one of the things that the copper industry right now is, I think, wary of or looking at in general is sort of the higher cost and what that does for demand. Um, can you talk about how substitution is expected to develop in this higher cost environment and how that might affect uh, demand moving forward? Of course. Um, of course, substitution is one way of balancing the market because it reduces demand for, for copper. Um, but the, the, the substitution is not that easy and uh, not that uh, homogeneous across all applications. For example, there are some applications where substitution is relatively straightforward, like power cables, like architecture applications, um, while other, uh, other applications, um, they have limited exposure to substitution, like uh, equipment wire and foil application, electrical uh, plate sheets, stri uh, strips and foils. Um, in this latter one, we don't expect uh, um, much substitution happening, even if the, the copper price is, is increasing. Some other applications have already very advanced uh, um, substitution, like plumbing tubes. Um, and here we will expect uh, the impact of the higher copper material costs uh, um, uh, um, facilitating substitution only to a limited ex uh, extent. And then also other applications where uh, substitution reach, reach the, the, the technical limits and the new um, research and development is, is required to, to, to move on and uh, um, uh, substitute further. And of course, this research and development is not only into alternative materials, but also in miniaturization, that meaning uh, using copper more efficiently. So we will see a different, uh, um, different uh, impact of the higher material cost. We will see in some applications higher substitution in another uh, other application, uh, the substitution will be less pronounced than in these uh, first applications. And, and what's the potential substitute? Is it aluminum in all cases or is it several different options? Um, can you repeat the question again? Sorry, I lost. I, I said, and what is the potential substitute? Would it be aluminum in all cases or would it be other? No. other? It's also different materials. This can be yeah. also steel, aluminum, plastics. It depends on the applications. Uh, um, and also sometimes also composite materials. Um, it depends on, 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 on that. But of course, in electrical applications, is, is aluminum is, is a key uh, competing material. Gotcha. Thank you, Christina. Mm -hmm. uh, Luke, jumping to you. Um, great presentation, especially on the EV market right now. Um, 2020 was a rough year for a lot of people, I think for all of us, it's fair to say, but i um, wondering why you think electric car sales actually increased in 2020 and what that says about copper moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we estimate uh, electric car sales increased by about 40% year on year in 2020. Um, a lot of this is policy driven and a lot of that was underpinned by Europe. Um, so Europe has a really um, tough policy for automakers of the, uh, the 95, gram, 95 grams of CO2 per kilometer for cars. Um, 2020 was a transition year towards that. Um, this year is the first year that it's um, fully enforced. But as a result in Europe, we saw automakers try and reach that target. So a massive increase in HEVs, um, plug-in hybrids, and also battery electric vehicles. Um, so that was a, a really strong driver, um, not to mention that some countries like France and uh, Germany also included um, electric cars in their stimulus packages and increased purchase subsidies to help um, weather some of the, uh, the additional costs. Um, and then if we look at other markets globally, so China again, very, very strong on policy. 
Um, they've got their purchase subsidy, which is going um, on through next year and new energy vehicle credits as well. Um, and then in the US, which is uh, less focused or, or was less strong on policy in 2020 and earlier, um, sales of Tesla's Model Y uh, really boosted um, the market in the second half of the year after lockdowns. So across, across the top three uh, auto markets there, um, we saw uh, lots of growth in Europe and then uh, modest growth in, in China and the US, um, which led to an overall uh, quite uh, substantial increase in, in 2020. And on policy, you mentioned in your presentation, Luke, that China is moving from a bit of a, a carrot to a stick, that is moving from a financial incentive to almost um, really prodding OEMs to, to have more EV, uh, EV, EV, um, EV cars in their lineup. How do you see yeah. that affecting copper long term? I mean, that it really is, as I say, carrot to stick, so it would seem to, to spike demand. Yeah, so I, I think that type of policy, policy transition is um, very effective. Uh, so this China moving from the purchase subsidy, which is being phased out, I think about step down about 10% a year um, and ending next year at the end of next year. Um, that moving to new energy vehicle credits um, is a real powerful driver for electric vehicle uptake. Um, and that transition is a real uh, powerful driver. And so along with that, we're gonna see uh, more inverters, more, uh, you know, motors and batteries, all which have contained copper, um, and that's going to have you know quite a positive impact on copper demand overall. Gotcha. Thanks, Luke. Uh, Peter, uh, do you have a comment on Luke or? It's just a little comment on China. Um, sure. I've been reading about the um, mandate for manufacturers having to produce an increasingly hard um, performance from their vehicles, and I've seen some views saying that there may even be a reduction in the number of cars produced in China up to about 2030. I don't know if you'd like to comment on that one. Uh, a reduction in the, the overall uh, number of cars in China. Well, no, actually it'll be a reduction in the growth of the uh, electric vehicle sales. So they, they're going up like that and they've got just slightly less slow. There'll be a bit of a kink in them, rather like the COVID crisis. Um, I mean, overall, I think China's heading in one direction. It's very focused on electrification. Um, and yeah, it, it's new energy vehicle credits is and uh, purchase subsidies have historically been founded on some very complex rules that um, have multiplies with range and energy density of batteries and things. Um, and the performance targets are hard to meet. Um, this is one of the reasons why Tesla, for example, is switching to LFP batteries um, for its Model 3 instead of continuing with, continuing, um, with NMC. Um, it's, it's low cost and it's just not taking any of those um, uh, incentives because it can't meet some of the performance requirements. Um, but overall, um, I think long term that you know, uh, China's heading in one in one direction with electrification and that uh, it's going to be um, uh, solid for the, the future of electric car sales in the country. Thank you. Thanks, Luke. Peter, you actually sort of uh, was a nice entry point into a question for you. Your presentation focused a lot on cars and light vehicles, but sort of wondering what about trucks, buses, etc. Okay, yes, our, our project was really looking at the broad brush of the major trends, big uh, sort of millions of uh, tons of copper. And so we did cover trucks and buses briefly, but not, not in so much. I think the, the thing to say immediately is that there are 100 million cars, uh, there are uh, 3.5 million trucks and 0.03 million buses and uh, <laughs> 59 million two and three wheelers, which are in target for being turned into electric. And so obviously the cars are just a massively larger uh, number than the other ones. But, but against that, the trucks tend to use about three times as much copper when they're electrified as cars on average. The two and three wheelers obviously use a very small amount. And the trucks and buses, particularly the trucks where they have fixed routes or areas, are certainly more active in the hydrogen side, the hydrogen fuel cells, which are electrif electrified, of course, but they may or may not use copper, which is just an interesting question to pose later on. Thank you. Interesting. Thank you, Peter. 
Louise, I want to turn to you. Uh, major props for your background, very on brand. So uh, thank you, thank you for that and your great presentation on urban mining. Um, you know, I think everyone's got a stack of old cell phones in their in their closet. So you know, the concept of urban mining is is one that I think we can all uh, lob onto. Um, we're seeing some new laws in different domiciles around the world. The EU, for instance. Um, is having um, a law that would force appliance, household appliance manufacturers to design appliances to be repairable and to last a minimum of 10 years. How is this gonna have an effect on urban mining, do you think, uh, moving forward? So thanks uh, for that. And what, what all of those, say, life extension measures for uh, appliances or for cars or for whatever contains copper um, will, of course, limit the amount of uh, discards that are um, you know available for recycling every year but at the same time um, they also limit the amount of copper required for replacing them um, so the whole the whole system of the whole idea of the circular economy is to do you know to keep those materials in the in the economic system as long as possible and a lot of the measures they aim at extending the life of the products, but at the very end, the products will be discarded. And therefore that's where urban mining comes in, where recycling chains come in and capture that material and make it go round. Uh, so it's either um, manufacturers, remanufacturers, uh, catching that value, um, you know, having some, some increasing repair businesses um, for those appliances, but at the very end, you will have um, a recycling and beyond that a metal working industry, you know, for copper and for all the other metals, also recovering that material and bringing it back into the cycle. So it's a matter of delaying that, that quantity, but the material will come out. Well, broadly, Louise, um, if you are a CEO of a copper company, should you be concerned about the urban mining trend or the circular economy trend? Well, I've interviewed a lot of CEOs in the past 12 to 18 months and, and they raise a very good point. Uh, that we're going to need a lot more copper uh, for the electrification trend, but still we're seeing an increase in attention to recycling. You know, if you were running a copper company, how would you look at this thematic? Well, the copper demand has been increasing very fast uh, in the past year. So even if you were to recycle all the copper that's available today for recycling, you would still need a very sizable amount of the market to be met by mining. Um, so if you have at the same time an increasing demand and efforts to extend the lifetimes of those products, which would you know, keep your, your recycling also down, um, when you're putting up all of that new equipment, that material tends to be primary because mm -hmm. you don't have all the equipment to you know, get the material from. So as long as the overall, uh, um, the overall demand keeps growing, um, we will see an increased need to deal with those discards um, because they're either recovered for their material content or they will be, you know, they will end up in some landfill somewhere and become a problem instead of a resource. And even if you were to catch all of that, there will be plenty of room uh, for primary copper there. As a matter of fact, there's a necessity for it. And there tends to be um, an, an either or discussion around primaries versus recycling. Um, and I think we need to just be, be cognizant of, of the need for both. So we mm. do need um, a strong recycling and recycling will need a lot of attention in the future because the, the mix of products to recycle is getting more and more complex. So it's getting more and more difficult to actually recover that material. Um, not only for copper, you know, if you look at Luke's example of uh, Tesla moving to LFP, um, recycling an LFP battery is a less, much less profitable proposition than recycling an NMC battery. Um, just because, you know, try to get that value out of um, phosphate uh, compared to nickel and, and cobalt. Um, so there's going to be a lot of effort needing to go there, but there's still, there will be a need for, for a lot and responsible primary supply for copper um, as far as we can see it. And do you see the skill sets that the primary producers have uh, being complementary to recycling? That is to say, if I'm a copper miner, should I be looking at recycling? Um, at some points they do meet very well. So you have um, 
um, you have a lot, a lot of smelters do include um, secondary materials, will tend to be high grade uh, in, the, in their anode ovens. You have smelters that are dedicated um, to recycling to secondary copper. Um, as you go further away from the metallurgy um, step, then the skill sets tend to differ. So of course you need you need to you know take some material and make it into smaller pieces, um, you know all of that uh, that is common to both recycling and mining. But the the, the complexity that you're dealing with is is different. Um, so when dealing with ore versus dealing with an ever changing stream of stuff um, mm -hmm. that we've all thrown out. Gotcha. Thanks. We've got a few questions, so let's let's dive into them. And the first one is for Christina. Um, Christina, the an audience member asks, uh, to what do you ascribe China's loyalty to copper versus the United States and the European Union? Okay, it's an interesting question. Um, China is generally uh, more conservative in in terms of of using alternative materials, and and the reason for this is is a more um, um, uh, firstly. If if there is a certain uh, um, uh, if 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 the power supply does not work, I'm just trying to say it uh, in in a way uh, that it it expresses. If the power supply doesn't work, then it is also personal. Uh, some some people will be personally responsible for it, and uh, there is a less uh, uh, it's more risk averse uh, alternative material uh, choice in in China based on the political and also the social mandate given to companies like, like uh, electrical distribution companies. And there's also to a certain extent, uh, um, it's, a, it's a more, more conservative society uh, as opposed to the US. And the US uh, um, has a much stronger cost pressure in the, in the market and much stronger competition as well, which, which emphasizes the cost pressure. So this is the reason why, why this difference exists. And of course, as China moves on to a, um, to a more, um, uh, to a new business model, um, which is more focusing on consumption, we, we expect this a certain convergence between the models. Gotcha, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, Luke, I wanna follow back up on something you had mentioned. Um, um, how does the copper demand from power electronics compare with demand from other powertrain components such as, as motors or batteries? It is my car versus my electric vacuum. Yeah, so um, we've done a few studies on uh, copper demand within, I guess, the main components of a powertrain and um, within an electric vehicle. If we're um, looking at where most of the innovations focused, it's, yeah, the battery, the motor and the inverter. Um, so within a battery, um, we have done a, a study that um, came to the conclusion of about 40 to 50 gram, uh, kilograms of copper for say a 50 kilowatt hour battery. Um, so you're, 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 um, uh, for a Hoover, that would be uh, slightly different because you have a, um, uh, a much smaller battery uh, of the order of uh, you know, half a kilowatt hour, something like that. Mm. But within the, uh, within the electric vehicle, you're looking at 40 to 50 kilograms. Um, within a motor, so copper is really essential for the magnet windings. Um, so the electromagnets that help produce the torque uh, for the vehicle to move. Um, depending on the motor type you're looking at, you can have a permanent magnet motor or an induction motor. Most electric vehicles are converging on permanent magnets. Um, that um, takes about 10 kilograms to 20 kilograms of, of copper per, um, uh, per motor, depending on your model or the market you're in. Um, when we compare this to power electronics, um, so uh, in the study that we've done, we were looking at about 500 grams for a silicon IGBT inverter from the 2019 Nissan Leaf. So, you know, um, half a kilo, um, you're looking at about a 60th of the copper from um, the overall vehicle, looking at those other components. Um, so it is less, but um, copper is nonetheless very essential. Um, we're seeing you know, a shift towards copper within the, uh, the power modules themselves, because there's an increasing trend for things like uh, power density and uh, copper helps improve uh, the, the thermal performance and, and so on. So um, it's less, but it's nonetheless important within power electronics. Awesome, thanks Luke. We've only got a few minutes left and I wanna to toss the last question to Peter. He had a great presentation on COVID. 
I think it's fair to say COVID uh, was um, a huge inflection point for the for everyone, but especially the copper industry, given the context of today's conversation. And um, you had a lot of um, specific granularity in your presentation, Peter, on, on where demand would go. We certainly have seen prices increase due to a variety of factors, but I'm wondering if you could talk sort of just a little bit about um, um, how psychologically you feel the industry is doing now. Do you feel a lot of um, optimism right now amongst the industry in terms of where copper demand is going? I know you were in you were granularity and, and with a lot of the detail, but if you could just sort of talk about, you know, psychologically where you see demand going, or could we sort of, if we have sort of another wave, could we sort of be right back where we are? I'm sort of wondering if you could throw it forward as sort of a last, um, sort of uh, to close this out here on, on where you see copper demand going. How's that going? For me? Yes, sir, yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Okay, yeah, I think the the signs are very definitely for more copper. So the copper people are right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the reason that it might be held up are uh, third wave virus, uh, very, very dangerous. You know, uh, it's happening at the moment and look at what's happening in India. Um, the, the reasons for the more are, for example, hydrogen, uh, when they get the hydrogen prices right, that's going to be a problem for copper, because it, particularly in vehicles, because hydrogen has some advantages over copper and some disadvantages. I understand. Um, psychologically, uh, I think the, uh, the trading problems, which the Americans, particularly the automotive people, have been having with um, chips, quite simple chips, they can't get them, and so they're holding up... Uh, uh, large numbers of cars waiting for components to come. Uh, that must be very dispiriting for them. And it means that with, uh, along with Biden, uh, they, uh, they're trying very hard to solve the problem. I don't know if you know this, but one of Biden's uh, new little giveaways was to allow the post office some money to buy a hundred electric uh, post vans. Yes, yeah. His idea is not that that'll be enough for them, but the idea is that they'll get them, they'll like them so much that they'll buy lots more. And I think that's been his policy all the time, to give little little tips for people to try and get them into the, into the idea of the thing and then um, make a winner of it by then buying a lot more. Awesome. Well, Peter, thank you very much for that. And thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, we're at time right now. Uh, so thank you very much for, for being with us, for sharing your expertise and uh, your insight as to where copper demand and supply is going in the coming years. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ernest.